okay, let's shift gears and go to Europe and talk about what's going on in Ukraine. And here we're focusing mainly on the U.S. Russian dyad. Uh, and it's very important to understand that the Americans drive the train in the West. Uh, Putin doesn't want to talk to the Europeans. He wants to talk to the Americans. He knows who the boss is. Right? So when you think about the war in the Ukraine, it's really the U.S. and the Russians that matter the most, in addition to the Ukrainians, of course. Now, the conventional wisdom in the West is that what is happening here is that Putin is an imperialist and he is bent on creating a greater Russia or recreating the Soviet Union. And what he is intent on doing in Ukraine is conquering that country, occupying that country, and integrating it into a greater Russia. Uh, and in fact, Ukraine is the first stop on the train line. When he's done with Ukraine, he's going to move on to other states like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, maybe Poland, who knows. But he is an imperialist at heart. He's an aggressor who's interested in building an empire. This is the conventional wisdom that you all know well. I would imagine that most of you believe this. My view is this is simply wrong. Uh, there's no evidence to support it. I believe that if you're going to make that argument, you have to show evidence that Putin said it was desirable to conquer Ukraine and create a greater Russia. You have to show evidence that he thought it was feasible to do that. And you have to show evidence that he said that that's what he was doing. There is no evidence, and I want to underline that word, no. There is no evidence that he thought it was desirable to conquer Ukraine or to create a greater Russia or to conquer any other country. There's no evidence that he thought it was feasible. And there's no evidence that he said that's what he was doing. Furthermore, he does not have the capability to do it. The Russians invaded Ukraine with 190,000 men. There's no way 190,000 men could conquer a piece of real estate with 40 plus billion people in it with 190,000 men. When the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, they went in with 1.5 million men. You need a huge army to conquer a country like Ukraine, occupy it, and incorporate it into your country. And you're not going to do that with 190,000 men. Furthermore, this man, Vladimir Putin, does not have the Wehrmacht at his fingertips. You've noticed how poorly the Russian army performs. So you have a small army that's not the Wehrmacht. There's no way this army could conquer all of Ukraine. And if you look at the strategy that's been employed, my argument makes perfect sense. This is not a case of Putin acting like an imperialist. My argument is, as I'm sure many of you know, that if you look carefully at what was going on, it's quite clear that the West's efforts to turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's borders was viewed as an existential threat. The brightest of all red lines, as Bill Burns, the ambassador, US ambassador to Moscow at the time said, by the entire Russian elite. The idea that Ukraine was gonna be incorporated into NATO the idea that Ukraine was going to be incorporated into the EU, the idea that you were going to promote an orange revolution and turn Ukraine into a pro-Western liberal democracy, it's unacceptable to the Russians. It was an existential threat. You might not think it was an existential threat, but what you think doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what the Russians think. And the Russians thought it was an existential threat. And they made it unequivocally clear to us 
that it was an existential threat. And how did we react? We ignored what they said and we continued pushing to bring Ukraine into NATO, pushing to bring Ukraine into the EU, pushing to turn it into a pro-Western liberal democracy. Why did we do that? I'll tell you why we did it, because the Russians were weak. That's what happens when you're weak in international politics. The Russians protested NATO expansion from the get-go. The first tranche took place in 1999. The second tranche took Second tranche of expansion took place in 2004, right? The Russians screamed bloody murder both times. We didn't care. We just shoved it down their throat. They were weak. And when they're weak, you can do that. 1999, we succeeded. 2004, we succeeded. Then in 2008, we said, we're going to bring Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. The Russians made it very clear, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. We're going to resist. And if we have to, we'll destroy Ukraine. This was clear a long time ago. What did we do? We doubled down. We just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And what you want to understand is that from the Russian perspective, this is an existential threat. They have to win this war. They cannot afford to lose it. If you accept the argument that Putin is an imperialist and he's just bent on conquering some more territory and creating a greater Russia, and there's no really underlying security imperative, then you can cut a deal and end this war. But if you think that the Russians view this as an existential threat, you think about this conflict in very different ways because you're dealing with a great power that's armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons that sees itself facing an existential threat. Now, that's my view of the Russian perspective on how this has to end. They have to win. They cannot afford to lose. What is American policy and what is Ukrainian policy? American policy is we're going to beat them in Ukraine this is, of course, Western policy. Norway is deeply involved in this. Our policy, our policy is to defeat the Russians, right? And uh, also wreck their economy with sanctions and also promote regime change and then put, in, put Putin on trial and maybe even break apart Russia. This is their goal. We're going for victory. We think we can win in Ukraine. Putin has to win. We think we can win. And the Ukrainians, it's an open and shut case. Of course, from their point of view, they want to recover all their territory. And they want to weaken Russia as, as much as possible so that Russia can't pay a return visit. So the Russians are pursuing a clear-cut victory. The Ukrainians and the Americans are pursuing a clear-cut victory. What does this tell you? This tells you there's no diplomatic solution. There's no diplomatic solution to this one. This is why everybody basically understands that this is going to be a protracted stalemate, right? Or at least they think it's going to be a protracted stalemate. They think it's going to be a protracted stalemate because there's no solution. There's another dimension to this, the most worrisome of all, and that's nuclear escalation. 